You might think that with the pristine beauty of nature all around us, that we're not suffering from a deep inflation crisis, a general economic recession, and a Russia-Ukraine war, which is actually crippling a once every second manufacturer of miniatures. So what do we do in such troublesome times? Luckily, I have the solution. The solution is to go super cheap. Once every second has always been a very cheap scale for all the people that don't want to share a lot of money. But we're going to go, we're going to try to find the best deal for you to get an army with the lowest amount of resources. It is a time of dire catastrophe. We have multiple simultaneous global wars that, for once, are not all in the Middle East. Although there is one there, because of course there is. Shipping costs are through the roof because of the Houthis shooting RPGs into container ships. So all ocean traffic basically cannot go through the Red Sea. No one cared about the Houthis before this. Like, who? Who are the Houthis? But as soon as they delay your PlayStation shipment, kill them all immediately. Right now. Inflation is far outpacing the growth of wages, so everyone is poorer. Interest rates are still high globally. It's basically just sad generally across the world. I can really see goth culture making a resurgence if this keeps going. And I don't mean the competent ones. I mean the ones keeping eyeliner companies alive, which double as circus clowns. Real goths would have killed us all by now and sacked Rome in the process. It was better in my day. In a time like this, it may be good to ask, what is the best value way to war game? Some better questions might be, how can I keep up with my mortgage payments? Or why is McDonald's expensive now? But I have my niche. You could even say I'm a specialist in my own way, like a surgeon or an orthodontist. But I work on the health of your wargaming rather than on you. Now, I would say that the first solution to solving your poverty wargaming woes is to give up on Games Workshop, but that's not going to happen if you are a Warhammer fan. You need to, you need to give up that Games Workshop, sir. Your, your wallet can't take it. I don't want to start a witch hunt, but I think some miniature wargamers are Warhammer fans first, last, and always. They're in wargaming specifically for Warhammer, and that's fine. If you want a house like mine, I spent too much on resin and this is what I can afford now. I got to go down in the basement and fix the roof in the basement. Why do I, I don't have a fourth wall. You can't, can't keep breaking the fourth wall. The bank said I can afford a roof in the next 30 years. But 3D printers exist now. So Warhammer style alternatives are pretty cheap. However, if you want the real thing, it is what it is. Good on you. I like Warhammer 2. I'm just buying less of it and none of it new. It's all eBay. Now, the absolute cheapest way to wargame is to make models out of paper or rocks or something, or just play a Total War video game, which is why I pose the question as value, because nothing beats free, unless you're somehow getting paid to wargame. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's not a job. One criteria I need to apply is scale, because miniatures come in different scales. I'm going to use 172nd because it's a scale I play in personally, and 172nd is renowned for being cheap. Which is a weird thing to be known for because there are smaller scales, but 172nd is cheap. It has a lot of plastic with high figure count. Like the hawker I solicited in Nantucket. The teacher who ran my high school war games club made it 172nd scale for that reason. That reason being like cheapness, not hookers. I don't involve my hookers in my war games. We didn't have jobs, you know. I'm surprised it wasn't a Warhammer club, but maybe he was just trying to protect us for as long as he could. You'd have to break child labor laws to join that club, let me tell you, or have the OnlyFans equivalent of parents. So my definitive final question is, what is the best value 172nd scale miniature set for wargaming? Now, in assessing what is the best value box in 172nd scale to make a wargaming army, I did my research across both the internet and my own collection, examining many ranges and companies, and my conclusion is the Hat Akhamined Persian Army. The Hat Akhamined Persian Army, Aka, Akhamined, Ak, Akhaim, Akhamin, Aka, Akhami, Akhamined Persian Army. You know, I'm very cultural, I know what that means. And, um, you know, obviously I capitalize upon my own deals. 
You know, what 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 kind of what kind of shill would I be if I didn't have my own Aka Ake Aminid Ake Minid Ak Acha Aminid Persian army from hat, you know? Such a great deal in one box. It's not gonna get a better deal, you know? What about them deals? We gotta make some great deals, alright? You ever got another one? You think I'd stop at one? Shh. Son of a I've got all these all these Persians up in this box right here. You know? Just unpacking it right now. The Hat Akhamenid Persian Empire is just a great value set. It contains 12 heavy spearmen, 2 heavy clubmen, 2 standard bearers, 8 heavy archers for the heavy infantry, 8 light archers, 3 javelin men and 4 slingers for the light infantry, 12 mercenary Greek hoplites, 4 heavy cavalry, 8 medium cavalry, and 4 light cavalry. That's 67 figures total. Wee. Now it's important to note that you don't get many duplicate sculpts. The most is four for each figure set. And mostly it's just one or two, so you get great figure diversity. But more than that, you get great squad diversity. There's heavy infantry, light infantry, Greek mercs, three tiers of cavalry. I'd say the only thing the box is missing is a chariot which most Persian armies have, but that's a small thing. If you look at it, you basically have a whole army in one box. One box, not a big Games Workshop mortgage payment box. A box that costs around 15 USD. That's a whole not terrible army, basically, for 15 USD. That's like one meal outside of Chipotle. You could maybe even find it cheaper if you go on eBay or something. A Warhammer army is a mortgage payment. A 172nd army is a meal. 15 bucks, you can spare 15 bucks. You could, even if you're completely invested in Warhammer and like they've got your parents in a, and then they have your parents held hostage somewhere, you could still, you could still afford 15 bucks. Like, I, I, I just don't think, I know, look, I know times are tough and I know everything's expensive, but 15, that's pretty, it's a pretty good deal. It's, it's a, uh, that's how much plastic toys should cost without the retail markup and the brand marketing that, that inflates it to hundreds of dollars. I mean, this is my house and even I can afford it. And this is the housing equivalent of being homeless anyway. It's unfortunate, but I have to admit it. I can afford it so hard. I could afford it even if I was held at gunpoint by kidnappers that were saying they would shoot me if I could afford it. I would have to say, I, I can't lie, I can afford this set. This is a set which is within my financial means. So I guess I'm dead now and then I wouldn't be alive, but at least I could afford the set. Value is subjective, but I think getting a whole army for a fast food meal is pretty excellent. You may already be skipping meals, so the trade just makes sense. Looking at the sculpts themselves, there is detail where necessary, with more complex textures of armor working alongside anatomically correct human figures. Now I wouldn't say any of the detail is exceptional, but it's good where it has to be. I quite like the Greek mercenary armors. There's some finer detail there. Human bodies are anatomical too, so that's not a problem, but I will say some of the sculpts are a little stiff. Most poses aren't very imaginative, just standard, which is fine. The figures are one piece, and they suit the purposes of wargaming, but they don't stand out or amaze. But you are paying amazing prices! All the sculpts are historically accurate, of course, because Hat do a good job of that usually, and they care about historical accuracy. There's a similar corresponding set for the Macedonian army by Hat, but I didn't choose to highlight that set because the bulk of the infantry pikemen don't come with pikes. You have to make them yourself. In my opinion, that's a lot of extra work, so I had to deduct points. Having weapons is just better than not having weapons, which is also my critique for TV shows like Love Island and Milf Manor. No, I'm not a part of the National Rifle Association. My reasoning can be mirrored by a recent discussion I had with a friend who didn't like Shogun because he didn't think there were enough fight scenes. To which I replied, many shows depicting domestic lives don't have fight scenes. You know, you don't have My Kitchen rules with fight scenes, though they, they, they maybe they should have fight scenes. And, and you still enjoy them? To which he replied that the existence of weapons on set 
constituted a dramatic tension that was never fulfilled. Their reality like a constant reminder of a broken existential promise. And that's how I feel when I look at models that should have weapons, but don't come with weapons. Which is, ironically enough, the exact opposite of the situation, but directionally the same feeling. But there are hidden positives which come with this set. The Persians are a popular faction for ancient wargaming. They feature in the campaigns of Alexander the Great, and they're also in the movie 300 as sexual deviants in the Greco-Persian Wars. And these are both popular settings for wargaming. We all want to be popular, and our subsequent failure and childhood trauma in becoming so is a valid reason to be a wargamer as an adult. People have heard of the Persians, hopefully from school, but realistically, popular culture has an asymmetric influence, and I guess they're just BDSM demons forever. Hellraiser as a sequel really deviated on the historical accuracy, but I thought the time jump was neat. And when the whole Xerxes family came out, I applauded the commitment to the representation of Iranian culture. I was driving once, and Lasting Lover by James Arthur came on the radio and it sounds like this. I feel like I'm lost without a trace, take my heart and run away. I, yeah, I heard that line as, I'm looking for a light-skinned lover. My first thought was, huh, can you, can you say that in commercial radio now? My second thought was, well, at least he's honest. It's bold to kill your music career like this. Maybe he just believed in his dating preferences so much, he was compelled to make a song about it. He's really light-hearted about it too. He's like, yeah, no, I just, I just dislike people of other races. Yeah. And this is how I feel about Zack Snyder's 300. He probably isn't a massive racist. He just wanted to make cool comic shit. But unfortunately, it's really easy to make dumb real life equivalencies when we live in an age where people struggle to read. Can I mention that James Arthur has attractive not light-skinned women in the music video. So once I looked up the music video, I was like, yeah, no, I definitely misheard that lyric. But he does kind of look like a chav. If you saw James Arthur in a dark alley, you would shit your pants, all right? Here, let's, let's change the soundtrack for a second. Anyway, so this is why Persians are in the discourse for wargaming. Persians are colourful, their army uniforms are not some bland single scheme, and they also come in a variety of textures. Could this be more challenging to paint? Probably, but you could simplify it if you don't want the trouble. But they're also a painter's army, with the possibility of showing off your skills with freehand. There's some flexibility in how you approach them, and that's pretty neat. Persians have diverse unit types. In this box alone, you get all kinds of different nations that have been folded into the Persian Empire. Because it was an empire, it comprised many different ethnic groups, and that's Q. This isn't a political thing, I know inclusiveness is a current trend, I'm just thinking of range of clothing and aesthetics in one army. I find it tremendously boring to paint the same troop type all the time, which is why my Imperial Roman army from 2011 is still unfinished. The Persians made use of Greek mercenaries a lot, so it's an opportunity to have the Greek bronze colouring in an army, and they have all kinds of different units like chariots and skirmishes and heavy infantry. So you get a lot of choice, which is fun. Having many unit types means it's easy to supplement this set with additions from other companies, or 3D prints if you like for model variety. And that's pretty cool. Um, if Iran wins World War III, you can pull the army out of your bombed out remains of your dwelling and show your devotion to the new world regime. Uh, I, I should say it is astronomically unlikely that Iran would win in a World War III scenario, but maybe it's good to cover all your bases, which means you better get started on that Han Dynasty, Chosun Dynasty, Kiev and Rus and American Civil War Army too. I can't think of any other positives, but the figure variety the army in a box approach for such a low price is a big one. You know, I think what Hat did was go, okay, what troops do you need for a Persian army? And just shoved sprues from the existing lines into one box. Normally, boxes of particular units come with like 48 figures or something, which is too much for my purposes. This box trims the fat, but also provides amazing variety at a nearly criminal price point. 
If I did have to criticize this box, I would say the sculpts could be better. They could be crisper. The poses could be more lifelike, but it's not a serious indictment. The minis look fine. They just don't look as good as the Vezdas. But the scope of this discussion is value and cheap. And boy, does this box tick that scope. So yeah, hat Persian army. I think this is the one. Shout out to my one Patreon sponsor, the Command Bunker. The entire financial health of this channel is in this man's hands. He's got a YouTube channel that covers various historical stuff, including Chosun Dynasty stuff, which I personally love. So please check him out. So you've seen the Sekel house. You've seen the water. And we've discussed what the cheapest boxes are for 172nd. In these difficult economic times, we still must war game. We can't give up our passion. But we also can't be broken, starving and living in the Sekel house either. You know, it's, it's too much for most people to bear. I'm not most people. I'm talking about the cheapest boxes and um, passing those savings on to you by information, I guess. So that's very useful. I don't know if we learned anything today, but 172 is cheap scale and the miniatures are good. So yeah, no, keep, keep on, keep on wargaming cheaply, not Games Workshop like style. Wanna let go, let go.